So today I would like to talk a little bit about the nature of awareness, the nature of mind, of consciousness. And so right right to start, uh, just to say that, again, this is a huge subject and uh, it would actually be more appropriate to perhaps devote a whole month-long retreat, minimum, just to this subject, and then perhaps we would begin uh, to, to uh, approach it in a more full way. So what I'm offering today is more, more of an overview, and maybe a couple of routes through this inquiry. So awareness, consciousness, mind that which knows. Sometimes uh, those words are used with slightly different meanings. For this talk, I, I'll use them interchangeably, those, those four terms. That which knows, mind, awareness, consciousness. At first, uh, in our practice, it, it might not be clear uh, that this has any relationship to the end of suffering. Buddha said, I teach one thing only, suffering and the end of suffering. And see, well, it may be of philosophical or metaphysical interest, what is the nature of awareness. It doesn't seem to have that much to do with suffering. But as our practice goes deeper, uh, it becomes more and more important and actually ends up being one of the, f- one of the fundamentally important questions. And... Uh, Penetrating this question is really one of the gates to freedom. And it is possible to approach it intellectually. And there are even schools of Buddhism, the, the Geluk school of T- Tibetan Buddhism, uh, from which the Dalai Lama uh, comes, that's his, his base tradition, uh, using a lot of logic and intellect to, to penetrate this question. Um, I'm a little too stupid for that. So I'm going to talk more from a practitioner's point of view and how we can actually use Vipassana practice to, to enter into that same question, those, those same insights. So I'm not sure, but I think if we stopped someone on the street uh, and asked them what is the nature of awareness, I mean, probably you'd get some <laughs> odd looks. <laughs> <laughs> Assuming they're friendly, <laughs> and you sort of persisted, what what might come through or return, and and the the sense that we could have uh, in the beginning, really years of our practice, is perhaps awareness is something like a mirror, some something like a mirror. There's the world out there, and some. In this uh, being, in this apparatus, there's something that sort of um, creates an image of that world, a replica. And for a practitioner, and especially, um, actually all the time, but for for a practitioner, especially in the first years, this is quite a useful image. And even, to go further, the image of polishing that mirror, polishing the mirror, so that we can see the world better so that we can see with more clarity, so that we can uh, look into our life uh, more more clearly, more deeply, see, understand better. So I think a week or so ago, Christina spoke about papancha, this ego proliferation, this uh, how we get spun out in stories and views and all of that. And all of that, in a way, is a cloud over the mirror. It's like dust or grime or... Uh, dollop of who knows what smeared on the mirror. Stories, all that, tend to, oh, not all the time, but sometimes they tend to obscure this, this seeing clearly. They obscure the mirror. Our preconceptions, our images, our views, our opinions particularly, how much are they colouring our seeing, obscuring, darkening, are seeing, making it incomplete or making it murky. Thoughts, moods, even subtle mind states like dullness, restlessness. 
So all of this uh, is very possible to actually see, to inquire into, how is this colouring, covering over awareness? And huge emphasis in practice to to work towards having that be, be somewhat clear, or as clear as possible, so that we can see better. And we can really see the difference. So, in a way, some people use the word mindfulness as that. It's a kind of a clean mirror, so we can see the world clearly. Pure awareness, that's a word that gets a lot of different meanings, but some people use it in that sense. The awareness then is pure, it's clean. And so, awareness becomes like this spotless mirror to reflect experience, reflect the world, inner and outer. But, is that the true nature of awareness? We say, and we hear in the teachings, uh, to be with things as they are. And so, if the mirror is clean, one assumes I'm being with things as they are. That's a phrase the Buddha used, things as they are. Is that what he meant? Is that what's meant? Things as they are, so that we can see impermanence more clearly. Is that what's meant? So this uh, metaphor of awareness as a mirror is hugely useful, and I think it remains useful, actually, on one level throughout one's practice, especially in the beginning years, really, of practice. A very, very useful metaphor. Uh, That clarity is what enables us to see how we're tying ourselves in knots, how we're perhaps interacting with people in in not the most helpful ways, in ways that are leading to suffering. All of this we can see more more clearly when the mirror is, is, so to speak, clean. So we develop mindfulness, we develop clarity, concentration, etc. There's also something else, the beginning of something else in this this particular metaphor. In a way, if you think of a, a real mirror, whatever passes in front of that mirror the mirror remains unaffected. So, beautiful person, ugly person, good person, bad person, horrible sight, lovely sight, whatever, the mirror remains unaffected. Tuning in to that uh, metaphor and actually seeing that there's something of that uh, that we can take into our practice, unaffected mirror, unaffected seeing by what's going on. Instead of getting caught up in that, we, uh, so to speak, reside in, in the mirror nature of awareness. Unaffected. And out of that can come uh, equanimity, peace, in relation to what's, what's happening in the world. But is that the true nature of awareness? As practice goes deeper, in some traditions, uh, there's a huge emphasis on paying really fine, microscopic attention to the moment-to-moment passing of phenomena. So sensations, thoughts, sounds, moment-to-moment, incredibly fast, and the mind tunes itself to this this really, really uh, microscopic, fast impermanence, arising, passing, arising, passing, And it can seem, when one practices that way, uh, and in those traditions, and it seems to have, uh, in fact it does have, uh, some backing in the commentaries, not the original teachings of the Buddha, not the the suttas, but in the commentaries, that consciousness too arises and passes. Many, many times a second. And it's possible to actually uh, somehow witness this arising and passing of phenomena, the rising and passing of consciousness. The true nature of consciousness is uh, very fastly arising, passing, arising, passing. Microscopic impermanence. And with a, with a lot of practice and really honing the, the, um, uh, the edge of, of the mindfulness, the concentration, it's actually possible to see this, to, to sense that. 
I have to say, though, I, I, uh, I'm not sure how much freedom comes out of that seeing. There's certainly some, but uh, there's often not, not a huge amount of freedom that comes from that. So we tend to think, if I could just see things faster, just that little bit more subtlety to my noticing impermanence, then somehow something's going to change. Maybe there isn't even an end to that. Still, some degree of freedom comes out of that, that seeing consciousness that way. And really useful, really useful. But still, is that the true nature of awareness? Arising, passing, arising, passing. Is that the true nature of consciousness? What has become perhaps a more popular way of practicing in our circles and in uh, in some uh, traditions of the Dharma, in some of the Thai forest traditions, in some of the Tibetan traditions, is instead of this very uh, narrow focus of awareness, a bit more emphasis on, on a, a spaciousness to the awareness. So we've, we've touched on this a, a little bit in the other talks. Sometimes opening up to the sound the awareness can begin to open out in a bit of a more spacious way. If in that little bit of space, that more spacious, expansive awareness, one then begins relaxing, letting go in some way. So by this I mean uh, specifically uh, beginning to notice what's called the three characteristics. So beginning within the context, within the, the backdrop of that bigger awareness, to notice the impermanence. So things, sensations, thoughts, sounds, etc. Everything arising out of that space, disappearing back into it. So this uh, spaciousness becomes a backdrop and the very noticing of the impermanence uh, helps that space to get more established. This is practice I'm talking about, this is practice. Or uh, as we talked about in the, in the talk on Vedana, to just keep relaxing the relationship one has with what's going on. And that uh, relaxing the pushing and pull, to uh, pushing away what's unpleasant, pulling towards us what's pleasant. The more we relax that, the more this space can get established. Or just regarding what's coming up, it's not, it's not me, not mine, whatever happens, sensations, thoughts, emotions, not me, not mine. There's a disidentification, and that disidentification is a letting go, a relaxing, and uh, this space again becomes more established. The other way, and it's very popular, is to, in a way, relax the attention a little bit. So one has a bit of a spacious awareness. This could be with the eyes open or the eyes closed. So quite popular, the sort of sky-gazing practices you get in some Tibetan traditions, with the eyes open. But it doesn't have to be eyes open, same. And instead of the habitual attention we give to objects, what's coming up, a pain, I give it attention, a thought, I give it attention, an emotion, I give it attention, a sound, I give it attention. Objects, objects, objects. One, uh, with practice, learns to relax the attention from objects. Just let them be. And so, for example, in this room now, uh, we tend to notice things or beings in the room, objects in the room. So, you know, there's so-and-so and so-and-so, and here's so-and-so. And we like or dislike or have a relationship with that. What we notice less what tends to make less of an impression is the space of the room. The space. So this really is a practice to begin tuning the mind in to the sense of space rather than always in uh, attending to objects. And it takes, takes a little training, but at some point it becomes ah, another groove that the mind can open into. So we could say relaxing attention to objects, we could say just resting in awareness. So e if it's either with the three characteristics or just resting in awareness or some combination, what happens is this space begins to open out, expand, 
become vast. It really is a practice uh, that, that takes some, some time for most people. Um, and what happens, to be precise, actually, is a whole uh, constellation, maybe a handful of states that are quite similar, but all sort of around the same thing. This vastness of awareness, expansive awareness, in which everything arises and passes. So a little bit like the sky, the night sky, and completely black, and then a burst of fireworks, and the color. Blackness and the color against, out of that night sky. And then the fireworks fade, the colors fade, they disappear, (coughs) back into that blackness, back into that space. This can be the sense of... um, of awareness in this more expansive sense. And we hear, uh, we either we read in certain teachings or we hear from teachers or whatever, awareness is vast like space. Vast like space. Beautiful. And then we see, yes, this is the experience now. This is the experience. It goes in and out of feeling vast like space. And so the the typical normal human consciousness sense we have of awareness being in the body, usually somewhere here in the head, that has got flipped around. And it's like awareness is vast and this body is in awareness. There's a lot of freedom here, tremendous amount of freedom. You can begin to, with this just watching the fireworks fading back into the sky, can begin to get a sense our experiences do not define us. The events of body, the events of mind, of heart, the events of the environment, they actually possess no inherent power to uh, constrain us or imprison us in any real way just stuff arising out of the space of awareness, disappearing back. Very real sense and a very real sense of freedom can come from it. And again, we may have read or heard, you know, something like, our true nature is unstained, is completely free. And this seems to fit right in with that. And we feel, aha, now I'm getting somewhere. <laughs> Finally, this, nothing that arises or passes in this space seems to affect the space. Pure awareness, it seems. Pure awareness. And it seems sensations, thoughts, motions, sounds, sights, all of that arises and passes, is born and dies. But this space of awareness seems to remain, does not seem to be born or die, seems unchanging. And this really really strikes a deep chord in in a person practicing this way. And you begin to wonder, is that awareness, is this vast awareness, is is that what people might mean when they say the deathless? Is that what people might mean when they say the unconditioned? Maybe I somehow just need to sink into it or just keep opening to it. The person has this very real question, but it's quite common. But a little reflection. What about death? What about death? So it seems to be steady, seems to be open and just there, and everything's arising and passing. How can we know that that, even that sense of spacious awareness won't disappear with death, the end of awareness? That awareness is something that's actually born with our birth and dies with our death. So if we're looking for, for a real deathless, a real freedom beyond death, We can't accept that unless we're going to just swallow something pretty big on faith, on blind belief. If a 
person keeps hanging out in that space and practices, uh, you know, with it, the, the, it can go deeper. The sense of it goes deeper. We touched on this a little bit in the question and answer period. It can begin to seem in that vast awareness that everything is somehow of the same substance as awareness, the same substance as this space of awareness. So everything that seems so solid, inner and outer, all of this is somehow actually just really in its essence, its awareness. It appears uh, to come out of and back into, but it's all just awareness. It's hard to find it. I was searching for for a, a good metaphor image. I mean, somewhat uh, to say, uh, like the waves of an ocean. So the waves come out of the ocean, they make nice shapes, or, or big, or scary shapes, or whatever it is, and then they go back down. But actually it's all ocean, it's all the same substance. It's all, in a way, impressions in awareness. Not different than awareness. This can be a very real sense, a, ex- a very strong, real sense that we have in practice. With practice, we have that in practice. And then can say, things, everything, inner and outer, is empty because it's, it's of the same nature as awareness. It's not different than awareness. It's not real in the way that we tend to think of, of it being real, because actually it's just awareness. And then this really starts to uh, seem to correspond with a lot of teachings that we've heard, and actually it does correspond with a lot of teachings that we've heard. And so in the Advaita tradition, uh, that's quite popular, we hear non-duality. You say, ah, not two, non-duality, not two. Yeah, that's right, everything's one. Everything's just one awareness. It's a kind of oneness. And there is, in this uh, opening that human being can have, beautiful sense of oneness. There's nothing but this vast, unperturbed uh, awareness, just existing by itself. Oneness seems to correspond very much to a lot of the, the deep mystical teachings that we hear. Or one mind. Again, it seems like it's just one mind. Everything is one mind. Cosmic consciousness. This is a very real perception, a very and very incredibly striking perception that one can have. Awareness knowing itself, the play of consciousness. And all this begins to really make sense. Self existent, just uh, eternal in a way, vast, unchanging, beautiful, mystical. Sometimes in that state, a person may notice there's a kind of fading away of objects and it's just uh, left this, this vast sense of awareness. And sometimes not. But it doesn't seem to matter. Awareness is awareness. And there really is in that, uh, in that opening a, a real beauty, a real sense of mystery. And a person that practices this way will be a lot, and has a lot of uh, experience entering into that opening, that state, will be very radiant, very radiant, very beautiful person. And they will feel a lot of freedom, immense amount of freedom and joy uh, for much of the time. But is that the true nature of awareness? It might be that a person practicing is is going through all this and experiencing all this. And what's quite common, unfortunately, is for people to reach that place, uh, after years of practice, certainly, but uh, to reach that place and to kind of stop there kind of stopped there. And the questioning has stopped. The inquiry has stopped. And it, you know, it's frankly, it's an amazing place. But is it a place to stop? 
So another person might feel quite uneasy, either with the idea that actually there's nothing out there at all, or, or some other, not sh- quite sure why there's an uneasiness there. Can we keep that questioning alive? Can we actually listen to that uneasiness? It's not comfortable, and uh, it can be. It can actually be extremely uncomfortable. I actually remember being on a long retreat and feeling like I couldn't find the answers to these questions. I could not find the answers to these questions. And actually bringing me to tears at a certain point with, with the frustration, with the, uh, with the uneasiness. With the so it's not comfortable to keep that questioning alive. If we backtrack a little, what might be some of the assumptions that are underlying something like that? In that state that I've just described, this beautiful, open, self-existent, vast, (coughs) eternal awareness. Awareness, consciousness, whatever name you want to give it, that which knows, has the quality of, the qualities of being extremely simple. Simple, very natural, effortless, passive in a way. Open. Versus something called, which it's often called mind, uh, which is a lot of thinking and analyzing and uh, all this stuff and attending to things. Because of that simplicity of that sense, there's a real beauty to it. However, is there some unrecognized assumption there. Are we perhaps, do we perhaps have a bias towards simplicity? This is, my, my experience, this is quite common. Occasionally, occasionally, you come across someone who's really hung up, they want everything to be really complex, and they love like the Abhidhamma and this you know, really intricate Buddhist psychology and philosophy. It's really rare, it's really rare, and they don't tend to, at least don't tend to stick around places like Guy House long. What's much more common is for us to have this, this assumption or even longing for the truth of things to be simple. <sighs> Relief from our usually complex minds. And we hear the truth is, is simple, it's easy, it's all so simple. And it's like, yes, yes, please, <laughs> can it be simple? And it's lovely, it's lovely. But... Are we letting our likes and dislikes or our opinions about truth being simple or complex or whatever get in the way and block our our investigation, our passage to the truth? Maybe truth is not complex or simple. Maybe it's actually beyond what we can even call simple or complex. A couple of other things that can come in here, like uh, in a very sort of insidious way. After a certain level, after a certain uh, yeah point in practice, words describing the nature of awareness, describing ultimate reality, etc., all begin to sound pretty similar. And someone can talk about vastness or spaciousness or nothingness or emptiness, and. Actually, there's a whole host of different meanings and levels of meanings. And so we can sort of describe our experience. It seems to uh, correspond to a lot of other people using the same words. Uh, and so, again, we tend to stop looking. Or we can tend to stop looking. Or also this notion that the truth is actually beyond concepts. The real, the ultimate truth is non-conceptual. So again, what can happen for some people is we get a little sloppy. We say, ah, we don't like concepts anyway, and concepts are responsible for you know, the misery of Western civilization and all that. And we just sort of uh, let go of that and say, I'm going to just be non-conceptual about all this. Now there's a real beauty in that, but it's possible that we could be being a little bit lazy, a little bit sloppy. Often when we say non-conceptual, there is actually a whole host of concepts that are operating just below the radar screen. 
just below the radar. So c- conceiving conceptuality is something very deep, much deeper than the use of words. So, this beautiful, vast, mystical, open, eternal, self-existent awareness. Uh, and as I remember talking to one teacher many years ago and questioning about this, and, and he pointed out, uh, yeah, but, but I wish everyone could open to that. But that sense there's still a sense of permanence in it, unchanging permanence, eternality in it. Being permanent, being eternal, it's still of time, it's still bound up in time. The Buddha, very skillfully and very precisely with his language, calls it a perception attainment. So it's a depth to which uh, perception can open to. But, actually, it's only a way of practicing. It's only an extremely skillful means of practicing. Extremely deep and extremely skillful. It's only a way of practicing. It's not the ultimate truth. Though that way of practicing is is absolutely fantastic and great. And as... uh, uh, I, think I said in the talk on Samadhi, my teacher Ajahn Tanisaro uh, said to me, get attached, Rob. Don't be in too much of a hurry to move on from these things because it transforms. Opening to this, being in this, dipping in and out, over and over, will um, profoundly affect the heart, affect the perception, the sense of the world, the sense of one's life. But don't move on too soon. Now, actually, it's unfor- like I said, unfortunately, it seems that a lot of people don't move on at all. It's quite common uh, to be, to just stop the questioning there. Is there something that's more true, more real? Can we keep that questioning alive? then a person might review their practice. They might say, what is going on here? Sometimes I can experience consciousness as this very rapid rising passing. Sometimes as this unchanging, vast, eternal, etc. Sometimes in the course of one sitting, if I have enough skill in, in it, I can actually experience one and then the other. What is going on? So, you know, sometimes I ask one, one teacher many years ago, what is going on there? And so, well, there's actually two kinds of awareness, and one is this very small, and one is a very big, and, and it's this whole complex metaphysical system that, you know, reminds one of sort of uh, medieval, uh, you know, uh, architecture of the planetary system or something. What's going on here? What's going on? Could it be, could it be that consciousness and the perception of things are actually bound up together, are actually inseparable? So that when there's a certain perception of very fast uh, arising and passing, consciousness begins to appear that way. When there's a perception of vastness and stillness, awareness appears to, to seem that way. Maybe how awareness seems takes on the aspect of the perception at that time because it's bound up with the perception. So now, if this is true, we seem to have come beginning to come full circle. What seemed to be free, this unaffected mirror, this space which was unaffected, is maybe completely bound up. That awareness is bound up with perception, with things. So, in a way, it's not free. This is the whisper, the beginning of something utterly remarkable, really, truly radical, completely radical. Somehow, in the very not-freeness of awareness is is the understanding of our freedom, and the freedom of, of, of all things.
So there's a couple of routes uh, onward. In fact, in fact, there's there's many, but I want to just highlight a couple. One one is quite simple. There's a global sense of awareness, and in that awareness, even uh, begin to notice less of a difference between, say, sounds and thoughts or body sensations. It all, it's all just uh, this global space of awareness and things arising and passing, and not really noticing the differences so much between things. More emphasis on the space. But taking one step back, and saying that sense of the space of awareness, that sense itself of awareness, even if everything seems to have disappeared and there's just this sense of vast awareness, that too is an impression in awareness. That too is something happening in awareness. And so in that moment, to reflect on that and keep reflecting on that, keep reflecting on that, this too, you could say, is just happening in awareness. So in a way, this is a very simple approach. Uh, what can happen? What can happen is that uh, well, it's hard to put into words, but consciousness sort of pops out, and there's a, a moment, a sense of something, awareness, not being of space or time. It's something not of space and not of time. Another route that's uh, probably more helpful because it gives a fuller understanding is to go the route of what the Buddha calls anatta. It's a way of practicing uh, where one, uh, touched on it before, one just keeps regarding what comes up as not me, not mine, not, not self. So sensations, thoughts, uh, emotions, sounds, everything, not me, not mine. Sometimes people have a little resistance to practicing this way because they want to just be with what is and just not do anything. I want to do less. But actually, without our realizing it, all the time uh, we're saying me, mine. Sometimes we're aware of it, sometimes we're not aware of it. So to say not me, not mine is actually to do less. It's to take that hook of me, mine, of identification out of experience. It's actually to do less. And again, uh, this is really a practice, this is really a skill uh, that we can develop. Not me, not mine. But then to go a step further and reflect awareness, consciousness, also not me, not mine. It's also just happening. So this is a more subtle level of practice, uh, it's actually more difficult. All this takes practice, and as I said at the beginning, I'm giving an overview, so if, even if it sounds, uh, maybe it does, but just abstract, I'm just giving an overview of, uh, of one possible journey. Awareness as well, not self. So this is quite important, to disidentify with awareness, because even when we've disidentified with objects coming up, there will be uh, some... Uh, identification with awareness left. That's where the identification will go. Okay, I can't identify there, so I'll go back here and identify with the subject, the consciousness. And in some traditions, you hear, you are the witness. You know, big, you are the, that's your true nature, that's your, uh, that's the ultimate truth of who you are. Yeah, Buddha says, go beyond that, go beyond that. Let go of the identification with awareness and see what happens. Uh, because there will be some subtle identification with awareness that's, uh, that's remaining without even our realizing it. So this is, this is a practice, like I said. If one practices that way and, and develops that practice, develops skill in that practice, there are three important possibilities. One when one lets go of all identification with objects or subject, there's just a most lovely, complete feeling of freedom. Utter freedom. 
ego self is not attaching to anything out there or in here, subject or object, anything at all. There's just a sense of freedom. Second thing, though, if one hangs out, and if one practices more, more and more, time seems to stop. Time, it's like moments or even stretches of time of timelessness. Something is happening to the very fabric of our reality when we disidentify, when we stop owning everything. timelessness or or and or objects begin to fade the things that arise no longer arise or they're there and they just dissolve things disappear including the sense of of space disappears What's important here is not the experience, but the understanding. The understanding. So don't not to over uh, value or overemphasize experience. It's the understanding that comes out of it. So, what is the understanding that comes out of this, or that, that hopefully will come out of it? What it means is that time, which we usually take completely for granted as some self-existent thing that's just trundling along, no matter what and the world, things, inner and outer, are both empty. They don't actually exist by themselves without, without this identification of, of the self somewhere. When we take away that identification, it's like the, the fabric of reality is, has nothing to stand on, and it begins to crumble and fall through the floor. Time things, objects, world are empty. They're dependent on, on the way of looking, on the notion of self in some subtle way, some subtle level. If there is no time really, there's no time really for awareness to exist in. No time. Where is awareness going to be? How is it going to... How can anything exist really if there's no time for it to exist in? And if there are no things really, and no objects really, what's awareness awareness of? The usual meaning of awareness is awareness of something, whether it's space or, or, or the bell or a sound or a body or whatever. It's awareness of. But if there's no something of, there's nothing to see. Nothing that awareness can see, really. So, as uh, Dor- Dor- is it Dorothy says in The Wizard of Oz, I don't think we're in Kansas anymore. <laughs> this is... This is <laughs> Shantideva, the, 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 one of the great Mahayana teachers. Why speak of that which knows when there's nothing to be known. Why speak of that which knows when there's nothing to be known, when there is no knowledge? So what we begin to see, consciousness, awareness, that which knows, mind, whatever you want to call it, is dependent on and wrapped up with, is not separate from perception. That, that's one route through not-self. As we go deeper, even deeper, uh, just a brief outline, what we begin to see is that consciousness, attention, intention, uh, perception, vedana, the push-pull that we've been talking about, uh, ignorance, a notion of duality, a notion of time, a notion of things, of self, all of that is actually dependent on each other, completely dependent Consciousness depends on perception, and perception depends on consciousness. All of these stand together, sort of propping each other up, inseparable from each other, 
There's nothing at the at the base of it. It's completely groundless. So the notion that we had before of awareness being something completely natural and effortless and passive and still, either the mirror or the space, now gets replaced with a notion, uh, or perhaps on, on the way to this more deep understanding, with a notion of something more akin to, uh, you know, a stage manager at a theatre production who's running around behind stage trying to make sure everything, you know, trying to get everyone looking right. Awareness is actually a tremendously active process for all this to appear, even when it seems like I'm just sitting doing nothing, I'm just being. Tremendously active process, which has no base. So this, actually, this whole notion between being and doing, and it's quite a division that we often get in the teaching, just be, I just want to be, versus doing, which gets a bad rap. Actually, see to see through that duality. Being is doing. No doing, no being. Consciousness depends on things and objects. Objects and things depend on consciousness. Consciousness does not exist in time. This is completely counterintuitive, completely counterintuitive. So the Buddha is very precise about all this. I mean, it's amazing how, how, how precise he tried to be, as precise as he possibly could. As I, m- I mentioned very briefly before, even this in this state of very uh, vast, open awareness, eternal, unchanging, and all that, there can be some fading, some fading of the experience of objects. Why? Uh, similar to when we're talking about the Vedana, when we relax the push and pull, relax the letting go, uh, because of this dependent origination, we're not actually feeding feeding the appearance of things. So there is some fading. But the Buddha is so precise. And so again, words can sound very similar. Emptiness, nothingness, spaciousness, etc. There are, in a way, in a weird way, there are types of nothingness. And the Buddha talks about this. What, what we uncover at the very deepest level is something that has no dimensions in space and no dimensions in time. It's beyond nothingness. Beyond nothingness even is a concept. It's gone beyond all concepts. Where there's concepts, there's ignorance. And the ignorance gives rise to things and, a, and the subject and the object in relation to things. So again, uh, some of the another Mahayana Sutra. Not to see anything is to see excellently. Not to see anything is to see excellently. So who's the other character? Uh, Alice in Wonderland. You know, curiouser and curiouser as we go deeper into this. Now it's, it's really gone beyond, uh, beyond what, what can be conceived about for something not to exist in time. It's gone beyond what can be conceived about. We come to a place where that which knows, knows nothing. It's not real in, in, in any way. It's not a basis for anything. It's groundless. So consciousness gives uh, is dependent on all these other factors, and all these other factors are dependent on consciousness. There's nothing anywhere in any way separate from anything. Knowing, that which knows, knowing, and the known, are not two, but they're also not one. They're not a multiplicity, and they're also not nothing. Consciousness is unfindable. It's unfindable, but not unfindable like some, sometimes you hear people say, it's unfindable like your eyes, like you can't see your eyes. Which is okay, but the assumption there is, well, your eyes are still there, it's just we can't see them. But actually, consciousness is unfindable because it doesn't really exist. 
actually it doesn't exist and it doesn't not exist. So some Zen uh, Zen traditions, uh, Huang Po and other teachers, true mind is no mind. There's a, there's a quote from, from Huang Po, he says, <coughs> he's talking about this true mind, this no mind, the, the true nature of mind. The people of the world do not awake to it, regarding only that which sees, hears, feels and knows as mind. Blocked by their own sight, hearing, feeling and knowing, they do not perceive it. They do not perceive the nature of mind. No mind, nothing to liberate. No self, no world, no mind, no problem. So perhaps that all seems very abstract and unreachable and not for me, at least in the next thousand lifetimes or whatever. But it actually is. It actually is. And in this practice, in this vipassana practice, this, this is these are uh, this is a thing that's possible for us to to, to come to to open to. And talk about emptiness, and emptiness is uh, that the 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 mark of emptiness. As one of my teachers said, the mark of emptiness is freedom and joy, and love. And it's it's really something that's possible. I'm not talking about abstract things or intellectual things. Shall we sit together for a minute? Thank you for listening. To learn how you can support the teachers and Dharma Seed, please visit dharmaseed.org.